Um, so thank you to the organizer. I'm very happy to be here. Um, I was in Chicago as a postdoc and never been back in the city since, so I'm really happy to be both in the city and at the conference. Um, so I'm working at the Humankind Museum in Paris, France, um, where I'm interested in how human populations are adapted to different dietary regimes. Um, and so I've started a project on the gut microbiota of uh, rural populations from Africa. Um, and especially interested in, in the influence of diet and parasitism in those populations. So well, all of you know that each human is associated to um, a number of microbial communities at different body sites, and they're all distinct uh, one from another. You can see here uh, the different uh, proportion of, of different bacterial phyla. Um, so each body site is really distinct from one another. And we've talked about it yesterday already. Uh, we, we think that they do matter for health and disease, um, even though most often the mechanism is not necessarily understood. Um, we do see a systematic decrease in diversity in a number of diseases, at least for the gut microbiome. Uh, we've talked a little bit yesterday um, how the diversity is not necessarily a good um, indicator for vaginal, uh, well, yeah, I don't know how to say that, microbiome, or also for lung microbiome. I know that diversity is not always associated to health. But at least for the gut microbiome, uh, it's been shown that there's a, re a reduction in diversity um, uh, as compared to healthy controls in, for example, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, obesity, autism, and susceptibility to salmonella or campylobacter infections. So the mechanism is unclear, but diversity seems still to be a, a marker of health, at least in, a, in particular condition. So I'm especially interested in the gut microbiome because it's especially variable among individuals. I'm sure you all know this picture from the HMP consortium in 2012 showing the variability in terms of taxonomic composition and the, the, the same diversity in terms of uh, functional diversity as we've discussed yesterday. Um, also, we don't really necessarily care which species exactly is there, but we do care exactly what function they do. And so there is a reduced variability, um, fu reduced functional variability compared to the species one, but still there is important um, differences between um, individuals. I especially like this figure uh, from uh, Fallon et al. in 2016 in Science, uh, which kind of recapitulates uh, the diversity between individuals from uh, Belgium. And it, it's kind of nice in the context of the debate around uh, enterotypes that was there earlier um, for the gut microbiome. So what you see here is uh, principal component analysis of the variability between individuals. And you can see that there are a number of individuals that really look alike. So they form a peak in terms of density here. And this is individuals that are driven mostly by bacteroides. Um, there's another peak of individual carrying ruminococcaceae. And finally, you can see, so there's kind of two areas um, of stable ecosystem that individuals are in. And there's multiple smaller peaks and continuums around. And here you can find uh, the peak of individual carrying a prevotella. So I think it's nice to see that there is a gradient, but clearly there are areas um, where individuals look uh, a lot alike. So there's like kind of favored configurations. And there's a number of, um, there's a distinct number of uh, optimized configurations. <coughs> So the question I am personally most interested in is to understand what are the factors that are associated with that particular gut microbial variability within healthy individuals, uh, within healthy populations, sorry. So outside of disease, just in a normal kind of context, what are the factors that uh, explain this, this large uh, differences between individuals? So we know that for the gut microbiome, diet is one of the strongest factors. Um, here you can see figures from uh, early papers in 2006 showing that there's a correlation between the firmicutes to bacteroides ratio uh, depending on the, um, on the dietary regimes and notably decreases with fat and carbohydrate rich diets. Uh, and also among bacteroides, uh, we know that Prevotella is usually associated with higher uh, fiber and carbohydrate uh, diets while uh, bacteroides is in, in increased with high protein and high fat diets. So specific taxa clearly respond to diet, but we don't know how much of the overall gut microbiome, uh, microbiome composition is actually responding to diet. So outside of diet, we also know, we've seen it yesterday, there's a, a very huge influence of age, uh, which likely uh, in a big proportion is tagging differences in diets. Uh, there's also an important effect of medication. We've talked about it yesterday with antibiotics and metabolic state in general. So this is um, kind of a recapitulative figure uh, from the same paper in 2016, looking at a Belgium cohort of uh, a little over 
1,100 individuals. So we've been looking at nearly uh, 500 metadata. So a large number of metadata collected for all those individuals. So it's really a very rich uh, database. And so what they've shown is that the top uh, category is medication, then blood parameters, bowel parameters, diet, health, anthropometric traits, um, and lifestyle. And yet, even when you combine all those, uh, all those factors, you only explain about 16, uh, at most 20%, depending on their model, um, of the variability. So there's still a lot of unexplained variation in that particular population. So that's for the top categories. If you look at the top factors individually, uh, one of the, the top factors is actually stool consistency, which is a proxy for transit time. This is just a self-reported uh, score for the consistency of the stool, so pretty easy to get. Um, antibiotics and laxative conception, red blood cell count, hemoglobin, which are all proxies for oxygen levels that end up to be in the gut, um, and age, gender, and BMI. So I think it's a very nice picture of, of the different factors that are influencing the variability. It's a very pioneer work because the, the sample size is large enough to be able to explore a, a number of different factors. Uh, smoking was not in that paper, but was in their NACOVA and it was not significant. I, I'm just saying that because we were talking about yesterday. So there's a large number of factors that they explore that didn't turn out to be significant. It could be power, it could be just because they're not um, strong enough. Outside of those non-genetic factors, we've heard the very nice talk of Emily yesterday about the effect of host genetic, uh, which I'm summarizing here. So my view is that the effect is pretty subtle, both in terms of the number of taxa that's uh, impacted. So here you see for the most heritable taxa, uh, how better the correlation between monozygotic and dizygotic, uh, the, the, how better the correlation between two monozygotic twins is compared to the correlation between two uh, dizygotic twins. So clearly here, there's a really big effect of host genetics. Um, and again, I'm, I was just showing you the strong association between LCT and bifidobacterium we've talked about yesterday, but there's not a lot of uh, genetic variant in general that reach that level of significance. Um, so there is clearly an effect uh, that's gonna be more subtle than, than on the overall composition. Okay, so one caveat of all those studies, every single reference I've shown you until now, and then there was a bunch, they've all been done in urban population from North America or Europe, so from industrialized populations. And we know they have, those populations have quite a peculiar uh, interaction with microbes. Um, they have a lot of uh, increased sanitation, reduced parasitism, um, and a decreased uh, transmission between individuals, whether horizontal or vertical. So that's just a figure, I mean, you don't see a lot of things here. Um, from Cho and Blazer 2012, showing that there is a number of places where we act to kind of uh, decrease or, or change uh, the transmission between uh, not, only, not only mother and offspring, but also between individuals. And we've talked about it yesterday um, in detail, so I'm not gonna go um, in more detail, just saying that um, those populations are very different from most of the time we've been um, um, living together with the microbes, and so we believe they're, they're quite peculiar. So in that context, one question I'm especially interested in is to understand uh, what are the factors associated with the variability within population in a different cultural context in non-industrialized rural populations where medication is very different, uh, health issues are very different, and maybe more importantly, where there, there is a number of parasites and a number of even non-parasitic gut eukaryotes, and how, how does that play a role in explaining the variability um, of the gut microbiome? How does the picture change between um, you know, industrialized population and non-industrialized populations? Um, outside of the factors shaping the within population uh, variability, I'm also interested in understanding the differences between populations, because uh, they could be explained by completely different factors than the one within populations. So what are the factors driving the differences between uh, populations? Uh, one observation that's, that's been uh, seen um, early on by this uh, pioneer paper um, and, and then replicated is the loss of diversity in, in industrialized populations, so here in Americans compared to Amerindians in Venezuela and Malawians. Um, and this has been actually replicated in a number of studies, so this is the paper uh, we published in 2017 just summarizing the loss of diversity, so here on the X uh, access to the phylogenetic diversity. And you can see there's always a loss of diversity when you compare a non-industrialized population, whether from uh, Africa, Asia, South America, as compared to American or Italian populations. 
So there is a big effect of the study here. As you can see, within US, we have very different estimator of the phylogenetic diversity. While it should be, it should be about the same, so there's an effect of which um, region the sequence for the 16S, how they did, how they did collection, how they applied um, the, the downstream analysis. But still, what's consistently seen is a decrease of diversity. Yeah. What's the y-axis there? The y-axis is, uh, yeah, it's not written, it's latitude. So I'm going there. Um, so what I've calculated that there's a loss of 37% uh, diversity in average. Uh, you can compare that to the 22% uh, loss of diversity when, when we looked at the um, disease. And so the, the issue here is that we're kind of comparing apple and oranges in the, in the sense that those two populations, those pairs of populations are very different. Um, and until now, the two main hypotheses to explain those differences is changes in dietary fibers. So of course, in industrialized uh, population, we have less dietary fibers and because those uh, foods require a lot of bacterial diversity to be uh, digested, we believe that maybe it is a reason for which there's a loss of diversity. It could be also because of sanitation uh, changes and, and more generally uh, hygiene practices, as I showed you just before. But one thing I just wanted to point out in that paper is that all the non-industrialized have always been sampled in southern latitudes around the equator here at zero, um, while the industrialized populations are always in northern latitudes. So there's also a systematic difference in terms of uh, latitude um, between those two populations. And, and we know there's a trend of decreased diversity uh, with increasing latitude. So you know, just to show that there's so many confounding factors that we don't really know what we're looking at and why those populations have re reduced diversity. When I tried to reanalyze the available data to, to get at that question, so I used a paper from uh, Nakaya Maidol 2015. And they have different data points in Asia, uh, and there, it's always pairs of urban and rural uh, populations. So uh, in Japan, China, Taiwan, Thailand, and Indonesia, so those are a kind of gradient of latitude. And in, in this paper, so the, the rural populations are still big cities, so I don't think it's an ideal design for rural versus urban comparison. But what you can see, even though there's not a lot of data points, is that there is a, a trend which is actually significant, and the correlation is actually pretty high, um, neg negative uh, 0.7, uh, between latitude and phylogenetic diversity, again, for the gut uh, microbiome. So I'm not saying the reason for the loss of diversity is only latitude. I'm, I'm clearly aware that it's not the case, uh, but maybe it's explaining um, a small proportion of that loss of diversity. Um, and I think we should investigate that question in, in, in detail. Okay, so those are really um, studies looking at a very broad scale, so it's hard to kind of tell apart the different, different factors. So what do we know about a more local scale? Um, there's been three uh, recent studies looking at the effect of urbanization, one in Russia, one in Mongolia, and one in China. And you would expect that if the change is, in, is because of uh, diet or sanitation, there are big differences between urban and rural samples in those areas, um, so it might influence diversity. And actually, the result is not that clear. So in Russia, they didn't find any differences in diversity. In Mongolia, that's the, this figure here, what they show, so here, let me um, drive you th through the figure. So here is the Simpson index, so a, a kind of um, evenness um, estimator. Here is the observed number of species, so a richness uh, estimator. And in, in red here is the very rural um, area, so it's a pasturing area, very low density, um, compared to a suburban area, and then in green, Ulaanbaatar, which is the capital city, so um, which is you know economically really um, increasing fast. Um, and so here, there is a tendency for the red line to be above the two others, even though in some, so this, and sorry, this is sampling time, so it's along one year for different seasons. So for evenness, there is a tendency of higher diversity in those Mongolian rural uh, individuals compared to the urban ones, but for richness, it's not necessarily the case. Here it's even inverse, here it's not significantly different. Most of the time, the confidence intervals are large. So um, the picture in Mongolia is not very clear. There is a trend towards higher diversity in, in, in rural areas, but you know, depends, depends a little bit on the seasons. And for the Chinese sample, uh, here they recapitulate their, their results uh, showing the urban over rural p-value, so how much it's higher and in which direction. And so everything that's above that line uh, means it's significantly higher in rural area and, and below significantly higher in urban area. 
And what you see is that the, it is significantly more diverse in the rural area, but only for low taxonomical levels. Uh, if you're looking at phylum or class, it's actually more diverse in the urban area. So that was a kind of counterintuitive results. And on top of that, this is only true uh, for evenness, uh, but not richness. So again, matters which uh, statistics exactly you're using. Um, so all of that to tell you that it's not as simple as just comparing two data points. First of all, it seems that evenness is more often higher, but not necessarily richness. Um, and second of all, it matters also in which season you are when you're comparing the two. So the picture is not necessarily very clear, and the difference in urban and rural areas is not maybe as, as expected based on the industrialization um, results. So that was in terms of diversity. Uh, what about in terms of uh, composition? Uh, we know there is a big shift in composition between industrialized and not industrialized area. Uh, here is, uh, again, the paper from Yatsunenko showing you that on the first axis of variation, you can very easily tell apart the American sample, North American sample from the South American and, and African samples. And you can even tell apart if you go to the third axis of variation, it only explains 3%, but still, you can tell apart those two uh, populations uh, pretty, pretty easily. They don't overlap that much. So there is a very strong effect of geography, if you want to call it that way. If you go more in detail, um, here, so it's, it's kind of a summary of a lot of different um, studies, but you, it's, it's shown here. Uh, what we see that in this Italian sample, uh, but reflecting again what's happening in a, in a lot of industrialized areas, there is an enrichment in bacteroidetes. I don't know if you see it, but it's this kind of brownish uh, taxa that you don't see at all here. Uh, and there's also an enrichment in blue here in bifidobacterium, which is because those individuals eat dairy products while the Hadza hunter-gatherers here do not eat any dairy products. So uh, even um, uncorrelated to their lactase persistent status, there's only bifidobacterium in, uh, in the Italian samples. And in reverse, there is an enrichment of Prevotella in, uh, in purple and Treponema in dark red. Uh, it's not even an enrichment, actually, Treponema is never seen in industrialized population. Uh, so there's an enrichment of those two taxa in a lot of different studies that have compared non-industrialized and industrialized population. So for bacteroides, Bifidobacterium, Prevotella, it, you know, given all I said before, it kind of makes sense that it's going to be related to diet because we know that Prevotella and Bacteroides are, are responding to diet in the, in the direction we would expect um, given the differences in diet between those populations. And for Treponema, it's a little bit unclear. Until now, people have claimed that this was lost in industrialized population. We should restore it in industrialized population, and that was likely the effect of dietary fibers. Uh, but I'm going to show you results where I'm, I, I think that's not necessarily the case. Okay, so that's kind of all the data based on 16S and taxonomic composition, but there's also uh, two, two papers that looked at metadonomic data, and they show that in general there's more pathway associated to a high-fat, high-protein diet in industrialized population as expected, uh, also pathway associated to xenobiotic metabolism, showing the influence of the overall industrialized environment, and also more antibiotic-resistant genes, uh, also as expected, even though there was a, a lot of controversy about the fact that we do find still um, a significant level of antibiotic resistant genes in isolated, quote unquote, uh, populations. All right, so that's, that was kind of the background uh, to show you what we know about differences among continents, among populations. Um, and so in that context, what I wanted to do um, in 2014 when I started this project was to, first of all, look at gut microbiome in hunter-gatherers, because at the time uh, they, were, they were never been looked at. Uh, but also I wanted to do a, a fine-scale comparative studies where the only thing that would differ between populations would be diet. Um, that was the original aim. And so kind of controlling for differences in climate, in sanitation, in industrialization status. And so, so we went to Cameroon because it's a place where there's a lot of um, different uh, lifestyles. So hunter-gatherers, herders, farmers, fishers. Uh, and so in a very small area, so you can see here the scale of 20 kilometers. So those populations live really, really close by in a very similar ecosystem. Uh, we've sampled uh, hunter-gatherers here in red in the northern part of this area. Uh, farmers in green and fishers uh, on the coast. Actually, here it's very small, it's maybe 15 kilometers, but it takes multiple hours to get there. Those areas are very isolated here as well. 
So if anything, if there's a difference here between those populations, uh, it's the coastal versus inland. Inland is really in the dense forest, completely isolated. People do not go, do not have access to any cities. Um, and here it's along the road, it's on the coast. So that's the only kind of uh, difference between those populations. The other important, um, that could have been an important um, confounder factor here is genetic background because all hunter-gatherers are pygmy uh, in terms of their genetic ancestry, uh, while the farmers and the fishers are all Bantu in terms of their genetic ancestry. So those populations have diverged about 60,000 years ago uh, based of, uh, on estimate from our lab. Uh, so they're as different as a European to an African. I mean, they're genetically very different, very easy to tell apart uh, based on uh, host genetic data. So, Differences in diet and differences in genetic background was what we tried to assess. And actually parasitism was just something I looked at by out of curiosity and, and, and for people kind of to give them some result outside of the, um, of the sampling, uh, but it turned out to be a, a really important factor. So that's just to give you a little bit of illustration of what it looks like, the area. So this is me showing them how to collect their fecal sample, processing the fecal sample on the truck, uh, just so that it doesn't wait for, for hours before we would go back to the lab. Um, and so here it's just us um, having filled questionnaires about their diet, their medical status, um, and so on. So we have a very low sample size. This is only 64 individuals. We originally sampled 80 individuals, uh, but we had to remove some of them because they were related. So we excluded any brother, sister, or parent offspring relationship based on host genetic data. Uh, and we removed, of course, samples with too low quality. So we had a lot of uh, questionnaire on their medical status and diets. Here you can see the output of the medical uh, questionnaire. So it's a PCA plot based on all the different food items. And, and what you can see is that we can tell apart quite easily the farmers from the fishers in terms of what they eat from the hunter-gatherers here in red. Um, the only thing being those dark green dots. So those ones are farmers that live really together with the hunter-gatherers. Sometimes it's mixed couples or it's just like one hut of hunter-gatherer, one hut of farmer. And so they're exchanging a lot of food. And so in the questionnaire, this was also reflected. So at this point, we're analyzing it separately because they're, they're bent to, they're farming, but they're so close to the hunter-gatherers that they actually eat the same thing than the hunter-gatherers. So we've sequenced the fecal samples, uh, both for the V5, V6 region of the 16S gene. Um, with a MySec instrument, we obtained 176,000 reads of a 300 base pair per individual. And we also uh, obtained metagenomic data, 50 million reads per individual, which is pretty, um, pretty high coverage, actually. I, I didn't necessarily realize at the time. Uh, but this is a, a high number of reads, both for 16S and metagenomic data uh, per individual. So we had saliva sample where we genotyped the host. Um, and then we were interested in, in assessing uh, parasites. So we have uh, microscopy analysis. Uh, then we looked in the metagenomic data to kind of pull out reads from parasites. And we also did PCR and qPCR when, uh, when necessary. So the results based on the 16S are published um, in that paper from uh, Morton et al. in 2015. And we're still continuing to work on the metagenomic data. So the first thing was to identify which parasite slash eukaryotes, I don't know how to call them because they're not really, well, you're going to see parasites. Um, so the microscopy analysis was done in Cameroon. Uh, and so we've identified three worms, three elements. Uh, Trichuris, Ankylostoma, Ascaris. So here you can see the prevalence. They're pretty high in the hunter-gatherers or farmers living nearby, so about 50%. So half of the individual um, carrying a Trichuris, a third of individual carrying an Ankylostoma, and about 40% carrying Ascaris. And, and the frequency is quite lower in the fisher on the coast. So they're not in the dense forest, but they also have a little bit more access to medication, uh, which might explain the difference. It was expected. And we also find uh, an entamoeba uh, in, in high prevalence, about 50% uh, overall. And so people looking at the, the, um, the fecal sample under the microscope are used to look for entamoeba histolytica, which is a pathogen, uh, but it looks very much like entamoeba dispar. It's actually not able, you're not able to tell them apart under the microscope. Um, so it was surprising that there's such a high frequency of this pathogen. Um, which is why we were interested in exactly defining which species we were looking at uh, with the metagenomic data. 
So for the metagenomic data, we did not find any trace of the worms. Uh, I think mostly because we, we simply extracted DNA out of the sample without doing any uh, concentration or a specific extraction method. So, so we, did not, uh, we were not able to explode the eggs and to have access to uh, worms' reeds. But we did have very easily access to uh, two protozoa, Antamoeba and Blastocystis. Blastocystis being a non-pathogen, uh, par non-pathogen occurred that you find actually, that's the only one you find in both industrialized and non-industrialized population. So for blastocystis, there are whole genome data for eight subtypes available on GeneBank. And for Antamoeba, there's whole genomes for Istolitica and Dispar, which again are extremely alike, but you can tell them apart uh, from their genetic data. And there's also 18 sequences for much more, much more species. So, for blastocystis, we, we looked first at the number of positive reads, but there's a lot of bacterial contamination in those data because blastocystis eats bacteria. So in some strains, there was a lot of uh, false positive. So we ended up looking at the number of positive contigs. Um, and here is shown, just as an illustration, the, um, the individuals and their, and their status for each of the eight subtypes. And so we ended up having positive hits for strain uh, subtype number one, two, three, and seven, which was expected uh, in that area. And we did qPCR on those individuals, and it was highly consistent, uh, except that we see much more co-infection with the metagenomic data than with the qPCR, uh, also as expected. But the qPCR is more sensitive, so both are, are, are complementary, but they were very highly correlated. For Entamoeba, we decided to use the 18S, another whole genome, because we have access to much more species. Um, so it was negative, always negative for histolytica, so we don't have a single case of uh, histolytica in that sample. It's not that unsurprising for adults, actually. For infants, the, the, it would be surprising, but for adults, because all of those are adults, if I haven't said it yet, um, it's not necessarily that surprising. And so we found three species with positive hits, Entamoeba coli, Dispar, and Hartmannia, which are all, we don't really know what they're doing. I think they're commensal of the gut. They're not pathogenic, but maybe they could, uh, at some point, be opportunistic pathogen. Uh, but they are present in the, in the common uh, flora of those populations, even though they have completely disappeared in industrialized uh, population. So it was concordant with microscopy, despite a high number of false negative in microscopy. Uh, and so in the end, we have a mixture of non-pathogenic species. Yeah. Quick question. Yeah. yeah. Tell me what these numbers are. This number has the number of positive contigs. So for each, well, actually, no, because that's 18S, that's the number of positive reads. So the samples are individuals? Yeah, sorry. Each line is one individual. And so this is the number of reads after very stringent uh, criteria. Of reads. reads. So I have metagenomic data, 50 million reads per individual. And I align that to 18S data or to whole genome for blastocystis. And we're required to be a perfect match, to have both paired end matching um, the sequence. Um, and yeah, and, and that's the number of positive hits. So it's very little for 18S because 18S is 2KB, of course. Uh, it's much more higher if you have the whole genome data, but we like, it was for this part, it was concordant between both, but because there's no whole genome information for the other species, for coli and heart many, um, I used 18S because it, it was still, I, I still could find some 18, 18S reads, so. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay, sorry if I wasn't clear. Okay, so that's, that's the way we define who's positive, who's negative. So the, um, the bigger picture is we have overall 65% of positive individual for Entamoeba. That's the number for the three different species. 75% positive individual for Blastocystis, the number for different subtypes. Um, and just so you know, Entamoeba would be basically zero in any North America or Europe country, and Blastocystis would be about 20%. Um, at least that was the number they found in, um, yeah, in one Belgium study. And that's just the geographical structure of those prevalence. It's not vastly different between the different areas. Uh, so this is the four subtypes, the three species and their prevalence in hunter-gatherers, in fishers, and in farmers. So the ST2 uh, subtype here is basically only seen in hunter-gatherers, really very rare in the other two. Um, and heart money here is also most prevalent in farmers compared to the others. Um, sorry, I meant fishers. So, but th there's not huge, huge differences uh, between the groups. So what's the influence of those uh, eukaryotes on the bacterial uh, microbiome? 
So first of all, the number of worms you're carrying is significantly associated with an increase in diversity. I'm always looking at phylogenetic diversity. I mean, we did uh, different indexes, but I'm always showing you phylogenetic distance. So individuals carrying no worms, one, two, or three. So here I'm pulling all the worms together. We've seen yesterday uh, that for some traits, um, it was trickeries that was having an effect in one direction and ascaris in the other. Uh, but for the gut microbiome, actually, they all go in the same direction. Um, so, so I just merged them. This result was not that new. Uh, there's a lot of literature about the influence of ailments on the microbiome diversity, even though it's not that clear, but there's basically two kinds of paper, paper like ours, which is looking at natural infection. Here it's in Malaysia, so it, it overlaps, it's not significant. Ours is significant, but still there's a tendency for a high diversity in ailments positive compared to ailments negative individuals. Also shown here for the number, for the, number of OTUs, so both for the richness and for the evenness. Um, and then there are paper of experimental infections um, with worms, in, in that case with Necator, in, in humans. And so most, uh, most of the time there's an effect, but it's very transient. It's not long lasting. So, um, so people were, yeah, the, the, there is clearly an association with diversity, but it's not extremely clear. And in other, other organisms like rodents, it's the same. Sometimes there's an effect, sometimes there's not. So it's not, we're not completely sure about what's the factor that are important there. But this was um, at least coherent with the previous data from the literature. I think that the, the most interesting result we had, because it was really completely new, is that we have the same effect for uh, protozoa, for, for eukaryotes, for those eukaryotes. And, and this has never been shown in, in any other study before. So here is a significant increase in alpha diversity uh, in individual carrying entamoeba or individual carrying blastocystis. And actually, a few months after we published that work, there's another uh, paper that got published uh, in French individual looking at the effect of blastocystis, the only one you can look at in, in France, which was a prevalence of 20%. And they also showed an, a significant um, increase in diversity. So that's, you know, that's interesting, and that was not, that's not that much known um, that you can really uh, have an effect based on those protozoa. So yeah, so, so we wondered about the similarities between ailments and protozoa. We know that ailments are a kind of, I mean, we know. It's suspected that they might be um, important for, uh, not important, but having a beneficial effect for health because they're kind of reducing inflammation status and they're used in uh, alimenting therapy uh, for some particular cases. So what, what about protozoa? Do we think of these as parasites or opportunic pathogens or do we think of them as like potentially just keeping a good balance in the gut and as commensal of the, um, of the gut microbiome? microbiome and, and potentially beneficial for health. So um, in terms of the correlation between diversity and diet, we, we did not have a higher diversity in hunter-gatherers compared to the others. What we see is a lower diversity in fishers compared to, to farmers actually, but it's not, it's not very strong. Um, and so at this local scale, there's no all those populations eat a lot of dietary fibers. Um, only the fishers have a little bit access to medication, so maybe that's what we're seeing here, but not a lot of, of differences in diversity um, associated with lifestyle here. So when we take kind of all those parameters into account in, into um, one big permanova analysis, so we did it kind of line by line for each factor individually. Um, in our sample, age, sex, BMI, and, and dietary items one by one didn't have a uh, significant effect, both on the OTUs defined based on 16S, on the species defined by the metadomic data, or on functional um, information defined uh, based on the metadomic data. So here on the left is taxonomical composition, and on the right is functional pathways. So genetic ancestry, pygmy bantu, no effect on the overall composition, uh, taxonomical or functional diversity. Subsistence, so hunter-gatherer, farmer, fisher, has a significant effect um, on taxonomic composition, not on function. And village, the specific village where they've been sampled has an effect only for low phylogenetic uh, levels as, as species or, or, or strains, not higher. And the bigger effect in our, in our data set is definitely the fact to carry entamoeba or blastocyst. It's a very strong association both with taxonomical and functional composition. And in contrast to that, the three different worms do not have any effect on, uh, on the composition. They only have an effect on diversity. So here there's a difference between the ailments and the protozoa. In terms of uh, subsistence, what, what, what do differ between hunter-gatherers, farmers, and fishers? 
So surprisingly, we had a higher frequency of bifidobacterium in fishers. It was not expected because none of those populations eat dairy that, that we knew of. Um, so it turns that the, those fisher on the coast have access a little bit more to cities. So uh, time to time, uh, we've been told that they could have yogurt consumption in, in the neighboring cities. So maybe that's what's driving it. Um, an alternative would be that they have more fermented products. So they, they do ferment the cassava. So maybe it's something that we didn't look into uh, in, in, in enough detail. But we have a very strong, um, significant difference between fishers and the three other populations. Um, we also do find two taxa that were kind of only found in hunter-gatherers here. Uh, Sarcina, which was already found to be higher in Papua New Guinea hunter-gatherers compared to uh, Americans. Um, and ruminobacter that were also fine uh, in higher frequency in Hadza and Peruvian uh, hunter-gatherers compared to Americans. So when you do those comparisons of American versus um, random hunter-gatherer rural um, populations, you don't really know what you're looking at. But here, the fact that we're replicating those two specific taxa tells us that those taxa are likely really correlated to long-term diet or some genetic ancestry correlated to the fact to be a hunter-gatherer. <coughs> But this clearly doesn't have to do with, um, with sanitation or, um, or other industrialized associated variable. Okay, so for the influence of Antamoeba, here you can see the, the plots. It's pretty obvious there's huge differences in, in, in really um, high frequency taxa. Here is the influence on Prevotella Capri. Um, and here in orange is the significant effect of, of Treponema. Treponema is in a higher frequency in Antamoeba positive individuals. Um, so we also did run a random forest classifier. We talked about it yesterday in detail, so I don't need to present the method. Uh, and basically, uh, for example, the third more important taxa to, to be able to, um, to predict who is uh, positive or negative for antamoeba is treponema. And we could predict um, who is positive or negative with uh, an accuracy of nearly 80%, so it's, it's pretty high. And so just to go back to the beginning of the talk, where treponema was in significantly higher frequency in non-industrialized compared to industrialized, actually it's lost in industrialized population. Uh, we believe maybe it's not due to diet, but maybe it's due to the fact that industrialized populations have actually lost a number um, of gut or carrots, and maybe this is why uh, it's been completely lost in those populations. It's an hypothesis. So we compared the effect of blastocystis and antamoeba. They're both associated to an increase in clostridia, specifically in uh, ruminococcus. Um, we had uh, discordant results between the two studies for Prevotella, um, but it seems that Prevotella and ruminococcus uh, enterotypes are in general associated to um, being more prone to um, colonization by blastocystis. So there are commonalities between those two protozoa. Uh, and also the decrease in clostridia is commonly associated with inflammation. So again, maybe a hint that say that uh, carrying those blastocystis and antamoeba is not necessarily a bad thing, but could be associated actually to a healthier gut, possibly. So in conclusion, uh, we've seen an important variability of the gut microbiome across a very local scale uh, among rural populations. There is quite a small effect of subsistence, um, despite those populations being hunter-gatherers and farmers for, for, for a long time. There is a strong effect of colonization by antamoeba and blastocystis on both diversity and composition, and an effect of worms only on the diversity. And there's a number of open questions. Um, for example, so I showed you the difference in diversity between industrialized, non-industrialized. Could that be actually a difference in prevalence of those occurrences that drive this difference in diversity? How much of it is driven by that? Um, are the effects of blastocystis and antamoeba direct through predation of bacteria, secretion of compounds, um, or, suscept or the vice versa? Uh, you're susceptible to a protozoa if you have a, a certain gut microbiome. Or indirect, like what is known for the helminth through the immune system? It's unclear. Is it that all protozoa are associated with increase of diversity or only non-pathogenic ones? Are there differences between strains and species? Is there an effect of the number? Maybe, there is a, maybe it's positive if you have not too many, but once you like really you have too much of blastocystis or antamoeba, it gets a different effect on the gut microbiome. Um, so yeah, in general, is this beneficial or not? Is this comparable to elements or not? How does that work? So I believe those questions cannot be investigated in industrialized population because they don't carry any more of those carrots. Um, so we really need to have studies in those uh, human populations uh, to compare different protozoa, different species at the same time. Here it's a like one by one analysis. I think now I don't have enough sample size to look at all of them together, but I think it would be interesting with a bigger sample size. That would be nice to kind of go in the mechanism of this relationship between gut protozoa and gut uh, microbiota. 
And uh, yeah, so we're doing more work on the functional differences. As I said, we're working on the metadomic data, on comparing the effect of those two protozoa, um, comparing the effect between our data set and the Hadza hunter-gatherers, for which there's also metagenomic data. And, and now we've just been back from the fields uh, sampling along a gradient of industrialization to try to compare rural, urban, from Africa, migrant individual in Paris that were born in Cameroon or born in Paris uh, to actually also look at early versus late life uh, events. And we're also interested in the um, genetic determinant of the microbiome. It's less homogeneous in terms of eating communally than the, than the heterites, uh, but still they're all also eating in big groups. So I believe it's, um, it's a nice setting to look at the effect of uh, the host genetics. And with that, I'm um, just thanking people at the Musée de l'Homme, uh, people from University of Minnesota with whom I've been working, especially Rand Blackman and his postdoc, Alice Morton, um, and people from the Pasteur Institute in, uh, in Lille also for blastocystis work. And thank you. So that's only adults. So I cannot really look at the effect of like early age or you know the time where the microbiome gets stabilized. Um, so we, we control for age in all cases. Age was not significantly associated with the microbial composition in that cohort because it's like between, it's only adults. There was though an effect on uh, antamoeba carriage a little bit more often with a um, uh, more advanced age. So we always controlled for it. But yeah, it's time period where age doesn't matter as much as what you're talking about. And you don't know how early uh, this population colonization occurs? Um, how early? I don't know. I know the, the prevalence is much higher in child than in adults. Um, for example, for histolytica, like we have zero. Usually it's, it's more around 10% because it's a pathogenic one. For the other ones, I don't know because people are not really looking into those ones because they're not, they're not resulting in any um, symptoms. So antamoeba dispar, antamoeba coli, nobody really cares. So going back to one of your earlier slides, you showed that clustering of the hunter-gatherers and the Bantu that live near them. And you referenced the fact that they share diet and so on. But at the end of the talk, it seems like they must share helmets. Did you, have you looked at that? Like, do, do they, they share, share helmetic loads? Do you mean, do they share the exact same <coughs> strains of helmet? Do they share, like, do they have similar patterns of prevalence? <coughs> well. Because they're very similar in terms of their gut microbiome. <coughs> So there, so that's here. So the prevalence of, oh, of Elmith, Early, sorry. The, two P, the PC chart. Yeah, the PC chart was the, based on the food questionnaires. Oh, that was it, okay. Yeah. So that was purely about diet, that was diet. Yes, PC. in terms of gut microbiome, there's no clustering by lifestyle. The random forest classifier does not work. You cannot predict who is a hunter-gatherer and a farmer based on the gut microbiome data. Okay. The only thing you can predict is whether you're carrying antamoeba or not. Okay, so I have a second really quick question. So, I assume the interpretation here is that if you get helmets, it changes your gut microbiome, but it could be the other way. Mm -hmm. A more diverse gut microbiome that may make you more susceptible to helmets. Do you have any idea which direction they are? Yeah, for helmets, I think it's pretty clear because there is uh, experiment of infection, and you see the reduction, uh, the increase in diversity when you infect individual, whether humans or rodents, with the helmets. So the causality here is a bit more clear. For protozoa, I have no clue. It could be really both ways. It could be susceptibility differences or it could be an effect of the protozoa on the bacteria. I think on ailments, it, it, is, it is causal. But on the, other, on the other hand, so for bacteria, as I showed in the beginning, they showed that the higher diversity is associated to um, a lower, well, that's in the other direction because it's pathogenic bacteria for Salmonella and Campylobacter. Like they looked at people before the travel and so the one would have a higher diversity before traveling, have a lower chance of getting infected. So here we also kind of know the, the direction. But that's reverse of what we see, but that's for pathogenic bacteria. 
Here we're non-pathogenic uh, protozoa, so it's a bit different. But for the ailments, I think it's, it's causal. 